50% of people that have a heart attack have perfectly normal cholesterol levels. What's the deal? How do you know if your heart is healthy if that's the case? Did you know that 33% of people that have heart disease, their very first symptom of heart disease is death? How do you know if you're that person? You don't wait until you have death as a side effect of heart disease until you do some testing and try to reverse things. So I'm here to tell you that you can test your heart health ahead of time before you have signs of disease and you can potentially reverse those if you make the right changes. My name is Dr. Philip Oom. I'm a functional medicine physician and I do inflammatory testing all the time to help people identify their risk of heart disease. So there's numerous tests out there that people are marketing to you as far as calcium scores and, and carotid IMTs and, and I'll talk to you about those in another video. But right now I mainly want to talk about inflammation. So the inflammation testing is a simple blood test. Some of them are urine um, but it's so simple and it can tell you where you're at in your uh, spectrum of potential for heart disease, blood vessel inflammation. It can catch you at the baby footsteps of early blood vessel disease. We were all born with perfectly healthy blood vessels and it's over time of eating burgers, french fries, inflammatory foods, inflammatory oils, too much sugar and refined carbs that we develop inflammation and start damaging these perfectly healthy blood vessels that we were given. And once those blood vessels are damaged, then you start to get heart, heart attacks, heart disease, heart failure, whatever you want to call it. The pathology is always the same, whether it's kidney failure, strokes, heart attacks, it's always blood vessel disease. So we're gonna go through this diagram real quick. I don't, you probably can't read the fine print behind it, but the basics of it is that everyone is born with a perfectly healthy blood vessel, and over time we can start to damage it. The first stage is inflammation. After inflammation sets in, then the cholesterol starts to crash land into the highway, and then more and more cholesterol builds up as the immune system attacks and destroys it even further until it springs a leak. Once the cholesterol starts leaking, it can actually form a blood clot. Once that blood clot forms, you are now having symptoms. Whether that be chest pain, stroke, death, who knows, you are now having a heart attack or some sort of blood clot in a very important organ that you probably want. So what you can see from this diagram is there are markers all along the way that you can test from normal all the way to heart attack. And so they're lined up up here, F2 isoprostanes, oxidized LDL, ADMA, microalbumin, HSCRP, LPPLA2, and myeloperoxidase. These other ones are heart attack markers, and I hope you never get those checked because that means you're at risk for having a heart attack. So I'm gonna go through each one of the markers and try to give you a few things that I would do for them and what, what you would want to think about. So the first and foremost is what's called HSCRP. That stands for high sensitivity CRP. We've had CRP for a decade. It's, it's been used in neonates and all kinds of things to identify in, infection. But now we're using microscopic amounts, high sensitivity testing to find out if there's microscopic amounts of inflammation. This is by far the most sensitive test that we run in, the, in your inflammatory panel. If your HSCRP is elevated above one, you're at risk. If you're above two, then you are definitely at risk. This is so important that it's actually making its way into conventional medicine. This isn't a woo-woo functional medicine thing. This is real conventional medicine. Where conventional medicine isn't quite sure where to go with this, and the reason why it's not catching on so quickly is they're really not sure what to do about HSCRP. They're not talking about nutrition. They're not really talking about lifestyle. They're just prescribing statins. So right now, the recommendations in conventional medicine say, check your CRP if it's elevated. Why don't you take a statin, even if you have normal cholesterol levels, because that's what the Jupiter trial showed was elevated CRP. They did better with Crestor. That's not what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you that if your CRP is elevated, you really need to start investigating where is your source of inflammation. If you don't have any signs of pain, then chances are it's from your bowels. Your microbiome is one of the most critical things that you can work on for your longevity. I won't spend much time on it in this video, but what I will tell you about is SPM active. So this is a component of fish oil that Metagenics harnessed. They basically took the body's pro-resolving mediators that says that if you have inflammation, your body's trying to turn off the inflammation by pouring water on the fire. This, so to speak, water on the fire is called pro-resolving mediators. This product that Metagenics created is SPM active. It's basically a fancied up EPA fish oil where they turned EPA, the fish oil that I've done other videos on, into the actual pro-resolving mediators that your body needs to turn off inflammation. So whenever we need to reduce inflammation quickly in people, that is a frequent, frequent product that I use. Next on the list as far as inflammation goes is homocysteine. 
Homocysteine is one of the probably second most important thing that I test in all of my patients. This is a marker of methylation. How good is your MTHFR enzyme, your B12, your demethylation? There's a whole huge topic that I won't uh, get into in this video, but I basically want to say that if you're not spinning your methylation cycle, if you're not appropriately detoxifying, then you will eventually create inflammation. I'm a perfect, perfect example of this. When I first started doing my testing after I got out of residency and I'd been eating fried corn dogs and not exercising, and stress to the max. My homocysteine was 14. My CRP was eight. Many of the patients I test aren't even that high. Just by tackling my homocysteine and dropping it into normal ranges, I was able to cut my CRP, my inflammation, all the way in half with that simple one little difference. So check your homocysteine levels. If your doctor doesn't know what to do, then you should probably either seek other help or start doing some reading on your own. I find that 90% of people can normalize their homocysteine with just a B-complex vitamin. Now the B-complex vitamin must have methylfolate in order to correctly spin the cycle, and I don't have time to get into that. The B-complex vitamin that I frequently use is one from Metagenics called Glycogenics, and I like the one from Pure Encapsulations called B-complex plus. I usually recommend taking those twice a day. Rechecking the homocysteine, and as long as the hom homocysteine has normalized, then you're in a good range. So the ideal homocysteine is less than nine, but ideally you'd really like to hit seven if you can. Now, if you're much lower than seven, then you actually have a different problem, um, and I don't have time to talk about that. So let's move on to the next one. ADMA and SDMA. So those are two more markers that you can find in your inflammatory cascade. These are markers of poor nitric oxide production. Nitric oxide won a Nobel Prize once it was discovered. Nitric oxide is a gas that is made on the inside of every one of your blood vessel walls and they tell the blood vessel to dilate and open. Well, if you do not have enough nitric oxide, then you have small constricted blood vessels and guess what? That's one way to spur a heart attack or thicken the blood vessels over time. One of the key ways to improve your nitric oxide production is actually to take methylfolate. So I'm gonna use the same recommendation for homocysteine, glycogenics, and B-complex plus to improve your nitric oxide production. Now there's many, many more things you need to do, including nutrition is number one, but that's for another video. Next on the list are probably the two most important markers, or I should say the two most scariest markers, and that's at the very end of the cascade. You can see that uh, myeloperoxidase, or MPO, and LPPLA2. These two markers, if they are elevated, are very dangerous. If you have one that's elevated, that's not good. If you have two that's elevated, that technically means that you are really at imminent risk of a heart attack. There's no way to know unless you test your blood vessels, unless you test for inflammation. So these two markers, the reason why they're so important is because it is actually signs of immune activation, meaning that your body has not only developed plaque, it's actually attacking the plaque. It's trying to get rid of the plaque, but it doesn't realize that in the process, it's actually making the matter much worse. Whenever your immune system attacks that plaque, it makes it inflamed and juicy. And once it's juicy and inflamed, it's very likely to crack. And once it cracks, it forms a clot and you are now having a heart attack, which is why those two markers are the most dangerous. So you can have inflammation, but not yet LPPLA2 or myeloperoxidase, and you are still at risk, but not nearly as imminent risk as the people who have LPPLA2 and myeloperoxidase. Next, I'm gonna talk a little bit earlier in the diagram as far as the early stages of damage. And these two markers are called F2 isoprostanes and oxidized LDL. The reason why these are some of the earliest markers of blood vessel disease is because F2 isoprostanes is basically saying that you have either immune activation or, or oxidative stress going on that you're damaging your cholesterol particles in the bloodstream. And in fact, you're damaging so many of them that you're creating these F2 isoprostanes that are ending up in the urine, and then we can test them and find out how much F2 isoprostanes is there and is there inflammation. If you're detecting F2 isoprostanes in your urine, then that is telling you that you are damaging your cholesterol particles, and damaged cholesterol particles always contribute to blood vessel disease. It's no different than our trucks on the highway. If you start blowing up tires and damaging the, the trucks on the highway, they're all going to crash. They're all going to end up on the side of the highway. Your LDL particles or your bad cholesterol particles have always been designed to be in the blood vessel. What they haven't been designed to do is be damaged in, in the blood vessel. So if your F2 isoprostanes is elevated, that's saying that you're damaging your cholesterol particles. That goes the same thing for oxidized LDL. So as I already said, LDL is your bad cholesterol. 
an oxidized LDL is an extremely dangerous LDL particle because now it's actually damaged cholesterol and the damaged cholesterol particle is much more likely to crash land into the blood vessel. And so that's why when you look at the diagram, the, one of the first stages is F2 isoprostanes and oxidized LDL. After this develops, then more and more cholesterol starts depositing and then you kick in the inflammatory response and really kick this into high gear and that's how you develop heart attacks. So those are two oxidative stress markers. So you would wanna work on your antioxidants and especially your glutathione production. The product by Metagenics called Glutaclear has N-acetylcysteine amongst other things. N-acetylcysteine is a primary agent that's used to make more glutathione and hopefully reduce your oxidative stress. Now this is a complex topic and there are a lot more things that we would do including major nutrition modification. But as far as products, that's the simplest thing that you could use to reduce your oxidative stress. The next marker I'm gonna talk about is microalbumin. Many conventional doctors use this microalbumin test for their diabetics to test for early signs of kidney disease. When we do inflammatory testing on your heart, we're actually going a step further. We're actually holding you to a much stricter standard than our diabetics. So for diabetics, we'll allow them to get up to 30 on the scale before we call them as abnormal. This scale is going all the way down to three. If you show any signs of protein in your urine or micro albumin in your urine, then that's not normal. You're not supposed to have protein in your urine. Protein is valuable. As many bodybuilders know, they've got to eat a ton of protein to maintain their muscle mass. So you may not be a bodybuilder, but protein is equally important to you. Why are your kidneys spilling protein into the urine, a precious resource? It's by accident, it's not on purpose. What that is telling you is that you have millions of nephrons, tiny, tiny, tiny little filters that make up your whole kidney. If you were spilling protein in your urine, then that is telling you that some of those microscopic little nephrons have been damaged and now they aren't filtering blood correctly and they're actually spilling the protein into your urine. That is not good. What that is telling you is that you not only have inflammation and blood vessel disease, but you have so much so that you're damaging kidney, uh, kidney cells or nephrons. So while you may not be on dialysis, that's an early sign of kidney failure and kidney damage. And if you are damaging your kidneys, guess what? You're also damaging your heart and your uh, brain. So it's an important marker to follow for early signs of disease. The next marker is something called TMAO. TMAO is actually a new marker that has been discovered by Cleveland Heart Lab, or at least commercially available through Cleveland Heart Lab. And the TMAO marker is an interesting marker that people often get a little confused. If you have elevated levels of TMAO, this is telling you that you have gut dysfunction. You have the wrong bacteria growing in your, your bowels. Now, many people, if you're healthy, you've, you've heard that red meat is bad, eggs is bad, animal protein is bad. I'm not on that bandwagon. I think we are... Uh, uh, what's it called, omnivores. And so we eat both meat and vegetables. So we were always designed to eat meat and, and, and eggs. And I, I, now some people obviously have trouble with those and we don't need to eat as much as a typical American or a typical Texan does at a barbecue. But what I'm saying is we should be able to eat meat without causing inflammation. So if you have these elevated TMAO levels, that's telling you that when you eat meat or eggs, which have L-carnitine, the bacteria in your bowels make something called TMAO. And this TMAO marker is a marker of early heart disease or early blood vessel inflammation. It's not, in my opinion, and I, I don't have research to back this up, in my opinion, it's not the meat and eggs that are causing the elevation in TMAO. The studies and research does prove that the elevations in TMAO are from a dysbiosis or poor bacterial growth in your bowels. So instead of just eliminating dairy or uh, em eliminating eggs and, and meat, to fix your TMA pro TMAO problem, which will work because you're removing your L-carnitine, you're not doing anything about the bacteria in your bowels. So this is one way that um, you need to improve your heart health by improving your gut health. So we do this all the time in functional medicine, although this is fairly unheard of in conventional medicine. The microbiome, the tiny little bacteria that you have in your bowels can either create health or sickness. So if you have an elevated TMAO level or worry that you do, 
then I would encourage you to take some probiotics. The main one I would like to suggest is Saccharomyces boulardii. One of the products I frequently use is called Ultraflora Spectrum. This has Saccharomyces boulardii as well as six other strains of Lactobacillus and Bifidobacterium. So a broad spectrum probiotic is the most critical thing you can take and there are multiple versions of that. The one I'm specifically suggesting has is actually a narrower spectrum but has Saccharomyces boulardii. I like to use Saccharomyces boulardii because it actually kills off off some of the bad bacteria and fungus. I don't know why. He doesn't grow in the human intestinal tract, but he kind of kills other things, so I like to consider it a mercenary for hire. So that's one way you can improve your gut function. Of course, increasing your fiber is a great way to increase your microbiome and improve it, but there will be more on that topic later. So if I can urge anything to you, it's that 50% of people that have heart attacks have normal cholesterol panels. Stop checking your cholesterol as a marker of heart health because that doesn't do anything. 33% of people that have heart disease, their very first symptom is death. So if you're worried, or if you're worried about a loved one, please encourage them to get an advanced inflammatory testing to determine where their risk is. Not all doctors offer this, and this may be something you have to search for through a different physician. Hopefully this video is helpful. I'll put the links to some of the products that I frequently use on the, the comments or uh, on the info. And if you or someone you know has heart disease or is at risk for heart disease because they smoke and drink and have all these unhealthy factors, then please tag them in this video, share it with them. Heart disease is reversible, so don't wait any longer. Start tackling it now. That's all I have for today. Please like and share my video.